Daily Minutes nummer 1557 met een uitzending voor vandaag 24 februari 2019. Dit is het bulletin van zondag. This bulletin will be completely in English. Vandaag dezelfde uitgebreide data als gisteren. TX Factor was er vandaag ook nog niet, de versie van het RCB nieuws van TX Factor. Dus we doen het met de versie van het amateur nieuws van de RCB zelf. Ik heb vandaag ook weer een wat langere toegeef, net als gisteren. Het is een interview uit QSO Today van deze week over onder andere mesh netwerken. CQ, 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 calling all radio amateurs and shortwave listeners. This is GB2RS, the news broadcasting service of the Radio Society of Great Britain. It's read to you by G4NJH in Nottingham. You can find the text of the bulletin on the RSGB Zone website and at the podcast at gb2rs.podbean.com. Good morning. This is GB2RS News. It's Sunday the 24th of February 2019. Here are the main news headlines. IARU active at WRC19 preparation. Enter the Club of the Year competition. Could you be RSGB Company Secretary? The ITU conference preparation meeting for WRC19 has been running this week and will continue into next week. Taking place in Geneva, the IARU has been present for agenda items on 50 MHz, wireless power and other matters of importance to amateur radio. There's still time to put in an entry for the RSGB Club of the Year competition. Entries are welcome from all RSGB affiliated groups and there is just one size category this year, so the size of your club doesn't matter. The theme is Meeting RSGB Strategy 2022. Entries must be received by the 28th of February. Clubs should read the rules on the RSGB's website and send entries to their regional representative. The RSGB would like to thank Waters and Standen for their continued sponsorship of the competition. The RSGB looking, is looking to recruit an RSGB member to the voluntary position of company secretary. The position plays a key role in the society's governance and provides vital support in the running of board meetings and the annual general meeting. For full information on the role, please go to the RSGB's website. If you feel you have the necessary skills to fulfil this important role or you'd like more information, please email the chairman of the board via chairman at rsgb.org.uk and if you're applying for the position, please include a current CV. For the first couple of days after KICKSAT-2 was deployed last November, nothing was heard from the satellite. But in February, NICO, PA0DLO, reported receiving several short and weak telemetry bursts on 437.5077 MHz. KICKSAT-2 was scheduled to deploy up to 104 tiny Sprite satellites into low Earth orbit. The Sprites then would transmit on 437.240 MHz at 10 milliwatts. The Sprites, which are less than 2 inches square, are expected to re-enter Earth's atmosphere within weeks. There's no news on whether these Sprites will be deployed. Provisional results for the last IARU Region 1 50 to 70 MHz contests are now available on the IARU Region 1 website at iaru-rfigure1.org. Several UK stations are in the top 10 in various categories. The 6R 50 MHz category saw G4ZAP Portable achieving 4th place and G0VHF Portable got 10th place. In the multi-operator 50 meg section, the GJ8P stations achieved 5th place. The ARRL has released version 11.7 of the logbook of the world configuration file. This has added the ability to confirm QSOs made through the JO97, FO99 and QO100 satellites. Users should receive a prompt a prompt to update their configuration file when opening recent versions of TQSL. The file can also be downloaded from lotw.arrl.org forward slash lot w user forward slash config dot tq6 
The RSGB has changed the way it hosts the online version of Radcom. This uses HTML5 to display the pages and no longer requires Flash to be installed. Pages will also load faster. All this year's editions are now available to members in the new format on the RSGB website and we'll be converting back issues from previous years in due course. Car parking charges will be waived for the West of England Radio Rally on the 16th of June at Froome's Cheese and Grain. Last year, Mendip District Council introduced Sunday charges in a number of car parks across Froome, including the exhibitor's site. According to BBC News, the council has announced it will stop charging for the duration of the event. And now for the details of rallies and events for the coming week. Today, the 24th, the Raynham Radio Rally takes place at the Victoria Academy, Magpie Hall Road, Chatham in Kent, ME45JB. Doors open 10am to 4pm and it's £2.50 for adults with free entry for children. There will be local and national traders, the Bratz Kitchen of Bratz Interactive Zone for Kids, Bratz Junk and Talking Station on 145.550 megs using GB4RRR. Also today, the 24th Red Rose Rally will be held at St. Joseph's Hall, Chapel Street, Lee, WN72PQ. Doors open at 11am. There will be trade individual and club stands, including an RSGB bookstall, as well as a bring and buy. Catering will be available on site. More details at www.wmrc.co.uk. Next Sunday, the 3rd of March, the Exeter Radio and Electronics Rally takes place at America Hall de la Rue Way Pinho in Exeter, EX48PW. Doors open at 10.30am. Disabled customers can get access from 10.15. Admission is £2 under 16 is free. There will be trade stands, bring and buy, catering will be available. Details from pg 3 zvi on 07714198374. To get your event into RADCOM, into GB2RS on the website, please send details as early as possible to radcom at rsgb.org.uk and we need to know about four months in advance for RADCOM. Now for DX News from 425DX News and other sources, George W2AIV will be on holiday in Belize as V31GF until the 2nd of March. He'll be on the 40, 20, 15 and 10 metre bands using SSB but will also try some slow CW. Logs will be uploaded to Logbook of the World. Willie ON4AVT will be active as 6 Whiskey 7 stroke call sign from Senegal until the 30th of March. He'll be operating PSK, CW, SSB, possibly FT8 on various bands including 60 metres. QSL via his home call, Bureau Preferred. Roman UT7UA is active as EM1UA and or EM1U from the Ukrainian Research Station located on Galindeth Island, AN006 in Antarctica. His license is valid until the 1st of February 2020. QSL both call signs via UT7UA. Gildas and Michel will be active as Fox Golf Stroke Fox 6 HMQ and FG stroke F6 GWV respectively from Guadeloupe, which is NA102 until the 10th of March. QSL, QSL via their home calls. In the ARRL DX SSB contest, they'll be calling TO3Z. QSL via F6 HMQ. Arnaud JG1XMV will be on the air as Fox Kilo stroke. Call sign from New Caledonia until the 10th of March. He'll be operating SSP on the 40 to 50 meet, 15 metre bands from the main island, Grand Terre, and that's OC032. Updates will be posted on qrz.com under FK stroke JG1XMV, QSL via JG1XMV, either direct or bureau, logbook of the world and EQSL. Now here's the special event news. H31A is being used to commemorate 500 years of the foundation of Panama City. In Panama, of course. The station will be on the air at various times until the 15th of August. They'll be operating on the 80 to 10 metre bands, particularly using digital modes, RITI, PSK31 and FT8, and some SSB. For more information, please refer to qrz.com, QSL manager HP1AVS. Please send special event details to radcom at rsgb.org.uk as early as possible for free publicity on GB2RS in Radcom and online. 
Remember that UK stations with special event call signs must be open to the public so our free publicity can make your efforts more widely known. Now for the contest news, today the 24th, the first 70 megs cumulative contest runs from 1000 to 1200 UTC using all modes, the exchanges signal report, serial number and locator. CW Worldwide 160 meter DX contest ends its 48 hour run at 2200 UTC today the 24th. Using SSB on the 1.8 megs bands only, the exchange of signal report and CQ zone, which for us in the UK is 14. American and Canadian stations will also send their state or province. The RAF contest ends today at 1800 UTC using SSB only, 3.5 to 28 megs contest bands. The exchanges, signal report and serial number French stations also send their department number or overseas prefix. On Tuesday, the SHF UK Activity Contest runs from 1930 to 2230 UTC. Using all modes on the 2.3 to 10 gigs bands, the exchanges, signal report, serial number and locator. On Wednesday, the UK and Ireland Contest Club 80 metre contest runs from 2000 to 2100 UTC. This is a CW leg and the exchange is your four character locator. On Thursday, the 80 metre club championships also has its CW leg between 2000 and 2130 UTC. The exchange this time is signal report and serial number. And next weekend, the 144432 megs contest runs for 24 hours from 1400 UTC on the 2nd to 1400 UTC on the 3rd, using all modes on both bands, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. The ARRL International DX contest runs for 48 hours next weekend from 000 UTC on the 2nd, 2359 on the 3rd. Using the 1.8 to 28 megs contest bands, the exchanges signal report and transmit power. American and Canadian stations also give their state or province. And on Sunday the 3rd, the UK Microwave Group's low band contest runs from 1000 to 1600 UTC using all modes on the 1.3 to 3.4 gigs bands. The exchange's serial report is signal report, serial number and locator. Now for the propagation report compiled by G0KYA G3 YLA and G4BAO. The Sun played ball this week and matched our predictions. The KP index soared to four on Thursday the 21st thanks to ongoing coronal hole activity, but it was otherwise settled. There had been good conditions earlier in the week. The ARRL International DX contest gave people contact into nearly all the US states over the weekend of the 16th and 17th. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Chris, G0DWV, worked a host of West Coast US stations, including some Oregon and Washington, via 40-metre long path late afternoon on Wednesday the 20th, although his beam helped a lot. This may also have been due to pre-auroral enhancement as the KP index surged upwards later that evening. Next week we can expect more of the same, with NOAA predicting the solar flux index at 68 or 70. Geomagnetic conditions will be settled to start with, but expect the KP index to rise again from around the 27th due to a recurrent coronal hole activity. We may expect the KP index to hit 4 or 5 between the 27th of February and the 2nd of March, so expect subdued maximum usable frequencies after the potential for enhanced conditions before the geomagnetic storm bites. As we head into March, we can kiss, uh, we can start to kiss goodbye to the long nights that have brought good 160 meter conditions. It's time to say hello to better HF conditions with excellent north-south paths, especially around no- noon and early afternoon. 80 meters may also start to continue to be open to the UK after dark, with the critical frequency just managing to cover the whole band at times this week. Now for VHF and up, the large area of high pressure nearby to the east and south of Britain will continue to provide good tropo conditions during the first part of the coming week. This long run of tropo weather, pretty much since the start of the month, is typical of slow-moving winter highs, but eventually the Atlantic lows and their frontal systems will always break through. This time it seems the changeover starts from midweek, as the pressure falls and the quality of the lift conditions fade. It's too early to talk of sporadic propagation, so that leaves the cupboard bare for other weather-related modes this week, but keep a watch in case the odd aurora chances by. 
ES Hale Sat continues to surprise and activity is high with reports of people copying narrow band signals with just an LNB pointed at the satellite and no dish. A 45 centimetre sky dish seems to give acceptable results, receiving the narrow band transponder. Moon declination is negative and falling this week, so the moon will be at low elevation for a short period each day, and losses are increasing as we go towards apogee a week tomorrow. And that's all from the Propagation team this week, and that's all from me also. Until next week. QSO Today episode 238, Andre Hansen, K6AH. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers for the radio amateur, who are excited to announce the new IC9700 VHF, UHF, and 1200 MHz all-mode transceiver. More on this later. And by QRP Labs, Hans Summers, G0UPL's kit company, and creators of many fine radio kits, including the popular QCX transceiver kit. Please support the QSO Today podcast by supporting these fine sponsors. Find links to both on this week's show notes page. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. Over 200 QSO Today episodes ago have passed since my QSO with Jim Kinter, K5KTF, about HSMM networking, using repurposed Linksys routers to create a ham radio broadband community network allowing hams to interconnect their shacks together with a parallel wide area network to the internet. This idea has since evolved into what is known as Arden today through the work of my guest today, Andre Hansen, K6AH, and his team of volunteer Arden developers. Our ham radio spectrum above 2 meters is very valuable not only to us as ham radio operators, but to commercial interests such as cellular telephone and cable operators. Employment of Arden in many communities throughout the world is allowing hams to occupy our valuable radio spectrum 2 gigahertz and above. A little explanation about Andre's picture in the show notes page. He is holding two microtick devices that are popular now in the Arden network. The small box is the Microtik LDF5, a 5 GHz transceiver that installs in discarded satellite TV antenna dishes instead of the LNA. The U.S. cost of this device is about 40 U.S. dollars. The larger device is a Microtik Base Box 5, also a 5 GHz link for much bigger antennas and for longer link paths. Andre says that the smaller LDF5 in, in a direct TV dish will work 30 miles line of sight. And now, without further introduction, Andre Hansen, K6AH. K6AH, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Andre? I am, Eric. Good morning. Andre, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? You know, every time I'm asked to tell this story, I, I have to chuckle. Um, my uh, sister, who was four plus years older than, than me, um, had been asked out uh, by this young man. Um, and uh, my, my parents weren't terribly excited about her going out with this guy. And uh, they learned that he was a ham radio operator. And so she signed up for a ham radio night school class. And my parents said, the only way you're going is if you take your brother with you. And uh, I was in fourth fourth grade at the time. And uh, so I got hooked on ham radio pretty early on. Um, I, uh, I, I, I then, during the course of all that, was taken up to uh, Mount, Soledad, Mount Soledad, a prominent uh, mountaintop on the coast here in North uh, San Diego County. And from there, this, uh, this young man and I talked to the, uh, the South Pole, which totally blew me away. Um, and uh, that's how I got hooked. So uh, San Diego County then, or San Diego is your um, hometown? Yeah, right. I live in the Carlsbad area of San Diego. And you've lived there all your life? Uh, no, I've uh, I've moved around quite a bit. I've I've had uh, stints in Chicago, Dallas, Phoenix, uh, Australia for a while. Where did you go to school? San Diego State. And where did you go to high school? Uh, in Claremont, uh, Claremont High School. I went to Helix High School. Yeah, I understand you're a local. Yeah, uh, El Cajon Amateur Radio Club. 
I know them well. I've done a presentation there. The uh, WB6 uh, uh, Big Green Spider, BGS. Right? That's right. I, I haven't been there yeah. since uh, 1973, so uh, it's been a long time okay. for me. What happened? I mean, you're a, about 11 years old, I would guess. Did you get your amateur radio license, your novice, or something like that in those years? Uh, I have to admit I failed the, the novice test, and it's it, it set me back, actually. I was uh, taken aback. I was convinced that I could do this. And, you know, as a little kid, uh, you don't know any better. And uh, anyway, I failed it. And then about five years later, I think I'm in ninth grade. I may, I think I was ninth ninth grade. I took the test again and uh, was able to pass it this time around. So um, then shortly thereafter, uh, within, oh, I don't know, four or five months, I uh, tried to pass the general and, and had to settle for the the technician license because I didn't pass the 13 word a minute code requirement. But then two or three months after that, I went back and uh, passed the code and then took and passed my advanced at the same time. So, uh, and that was uh, 1970, 69, 70. What was your first call sign? That was WN6AQZ. That became WA6AQZ when I got my uh, upgrade. And then um, I didn't pass my it, it extra class until I think it was 2007 uh, when I went hunting for a one by two call and found K6AH, which I've held since then. I did have an interim call sign, uh, KE6UQ. The FCC was really never never a good to me in issuing call signs. Um, and then uh, when I was in Australia, I operated as VK3DSH. Did you have any mentors or Elmers that helped you along? I did. I had uh, two primary Elmers. Uh, one was uh, David Corsiglia, WA6TWF. He was the young man that was uh, wanting to date my sister. He uh, he went on to uh, to uh, build and and continues to own the Southern California Super System, which is a network of uh, UHF repeaters throughout Southern California. Uh, and the other was uh, Don Stansifer, W6LRU. Uh, and before he became a silent key, he uh, got a vanity call, N6RU. Uh, he was the man who uh, was, he did the instructing in this uh, ham radio night school class. And I, I went to that class for years, even after I'd gotten uh, my advance ticket, uh, because uh, he was always so full of knowledge and eager to help and uh, it was a classroom full of of uh, new and existing hams who were either trying to get into the hobby or upgrade their license, and uh, it was a great, great time to socialize and kind of get knitted into the ham radio community. Those are the two that I would uh, I would uh, you know lift up as the primary ones for me. Well, I haven't heard uh, David's name for over forty years, but of course he was well known uh, even forty years ago. I spent a fair bit of time at the club station there and uh, had fun doing so. You know, I I think uh, they didn't really have current equipment at the time, so I you know I was a bit of taken back by that. But I I had uh, had plenty to play with at the house. So do you remember your first rig? I do. Um, yeah, it was an uh, the transmitter was an LMAC AF67. I think they called it the Transciter, if I remember correctly. Um, and it was a, it was my novice radio. It had a, two crystal slots, and it actually had a VFO, which I wasn't able to use as a novice, of course. Um, and then I had a Halicrafters S120 receiver, which was really built for the uh, sh- shortwave listening market and didn't have a lot of selectivity uh, nor sensitivity for that matter. So, you know, I worked, you know, locals. Um, I, I built a power supply for the transmitter and got it up and operating and um that was my first uh my f- first uh you know pair of radios and then <clears throat> my uh, parents for christmas one year bought me an SB102 heath kit um kit and uh I put it together over the following week or so uh and I can re- I can remember the, the the only time my parents ever let me call in sick when I wasn't really deathly ill um, they, they let me call in sick for the first three days of the new year in order to finish the, 
the uh, the kit, and uh, that was a, a great radio. It still is a great radio. Well, it sounds like your parents were terrific t- as well. <laughs> yeah, they were real supportive. Yeah, yeah. I'll say. Yeah. <clears throat> and what kind of antenna did they let you put on top of their house? It was an 18 AVT, if I recall correctly, and uh, we lived in an apartment complex, and uh, I convinced the property management firm uh, that there would be some value to the entire community for me having this antenna on the roof, and they went along with it. This was long before. And what was the value that you convinced them? What could you do for them? Well, uh, I I had started um, becoming involved when I got my driver's license with ARES, and um, you know I gave them the MCOM. Um, I used the MCOM approach to convince them. Uh, they were nice. They were nice people. They, you know, if if uh, so, unless somebody was likely to get hurt or um, you know, or it was a real community nuisance, uh, they they would go along with it. It wasn't a tough sell. Did ham radio play a part then in the choices that you made for your education and career? Um, it it did. Um, I went through the engineering electrical engineering program at San Diego State, um, and uh, from there I uh, got a a job as a sales engineer for an an audio a professional audio uh, product manufacturer, and then from there to a junior engineering position with a uh, micro-based uh, computer manufacturer, uh, long qu- quite a ways before the PC became popular. Um, so it was uh, it was real innovative, and uh, the engineering group at that company didn't have a lot of experience with uh, the current thinking and microprocessor architecture. And I had just you know come out of a program that that uh, focused on that. And I also worked for uh, the Naval Electronics Lab. Uh, here in San Diego out on Point Loma as a junior engineer, and that was part of a uh, a contract they uh, they had with the San Diego State University Foundation, uh, which among other things, uh, you know, found uh, part time jobs for engineering students uh, so that they could uh, get practical hands on concurrent with their education. It's a great program. Loved it. Were you a, an electronic engineer throughout your career, and are you are you still working? I moved to uh, the I, the IT side uh, fairly early on, and I uh, had a career as uh, a, a manager in uh, in IT and product development uh, for a computer services company that uh, transacted uh, uh, credit transactions. Then uh, I w- went into project management. I started my own project management uh, 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 consultancy. And um, then uh, decided that uh, I had been working too hard and it was time to spend more time with my family. And I went back to becoming a, uh, you know, a, a, a project manager out, uh, out, of, out of the management side of the business altogether. And uh, that, that was really my last job, uh, 10 years at Abbott Laboratories. Uh, and I retired about two years ago. Wow. Good for you. We were we talked uh, before you know I started rolling the tape that uh, you're more active now as a uh, as a mobile amateur. Well, what's your current rig? Um, it's an uh, ICOM IC seven thousand and uh, a high Q uh, five stroke eighty antenna, uh, and then I've got a Kenwood TMD seven hundred also in the car, which is a, a dual band a dual band dual VHF, band two mm-hmm. Yep. And so most of your operation yep. is uh, mobile. And you, you said to me that, that you've worked a number of com- uh, countries uh, on uh, HF Mobile. Is that right? How many countries have you worked? Yeah, I, I think it's over 150. The last time I uh, counted, I think I was approaching that number. I, you know, I logged those, uh, the, the interesting ones, and, um, but, I, but I'm not a DX chaser, and I'm certainly not, a, not somebody that, feels a need to uh, get re- rewarded for the number of countries. I don't submit them uh, for any awards and that sort of thing. But I do enjoy uh, when I'm driving down the road, having the HF radio on and tuning around, uh, finding interesting conversations to keep me company while I'm driving. Do you have a favorite band when you're out there driving or do you operate multiband? Yeah, well, multiband, but 
uh, you know, propagation being what it is, it's really 75 and 40 meters. Um, yeah, probably 40, I would say, is uh, the most common uh, band you'll find me on. On single sideband. Yep, sure. In episode 18 of the QSO Today podcast, over 200 episodes ago, I interviewed Jim Kinter, K5KTF, about the HSMM slash mesh networking based in Austin, Texas. What is Arden, and how is it different from HSMM mesh? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the expression or the acronym HSMM stands for High Speed Multimedia. It was an acronym that the ARRL coined. And uh, Jim Kinter and that group in Austin, Texas, started being known as HSMM, but uh, the league quickly asked them to change that because that was a term that was intended to be more generic than any particular implementation of HSMM. Um, And HSMM didn't define the modulation techniques. It didn't define you know, the uh, the operational parameters of the technology. It, and in fact, it never really built uh, operational systems around what they coined to be HSMM. Jim Kinter was with Broadband Hamnet or BBHN. And uh, going back uh, several years, uh, when they were limited to the Linksys WRT54G, that's that little uh, blue and dark gray uh, Wi-Fi router that everybody has in their garage. They retired some right. time ago. Um, and, and so that had limited range. It had, I think, 19 milliwatts was its power uh, limit. Uh, wasn't real practical for anything but sort of neighborhood experimentation or extending Internet out to the shack uh, and so forth. So... Um, I and a, and a partner of mine approached uh, Broadband Hamnet and uh, asked if we, the two of us, could uh, do software development for them to port that software over to more viable, more tower viable uh, devices. And they agreed to that. So for a period of, oh, a year, year and a half or so, uh, my partner and I, you know, developed that software and introduced compatibility with uh, some commercially viable devices that were at the time were being used by the wireless ISP community, uh, delivering internet access to homes in rural America. And uh, those became popular very quickly. Unfortunately, uh, there came a need due to uh, differences of priority and opinion on where we should head uh, the project was forked uh, into uh, Arden, which continued on developing uh, software around the core BBHN uh, open source uh, core. And that has evolved over the course of the last four or five years to be what Arden is today. So we have common roots. And now this message from ICOM America. I'm so excited to be able to tell you about the new ICOM IC9700 SDR transceiver. ICOM had in mind the weak signal operator when it applied its DSP and direct sampling technology to the IC9700's receiver design, allowing the operator to dig out the faintest signals from moon bounce and meteor scatter contacts. The ICOM IC9700 is a tri-band VHF, UHF, and 1200 MHz transceiver. Operating modes include AM, single sideband, FM, CW, RTTY, and all of the digital modes. You can even use the IC9700 to talk on the local D-Star repeater, making it an ideal rig for exploring the amateur bands 2 meters and above. For the satellite operator, the IC9700 has dual independent receivers that allow full duplex crossband operation with normal and reverse tracking, and 99 memory slots for your favorite satellites. The IC9700 is beautifully appointed with an almost identical footprint to the IC7300. It will make a beautiful sidekick to your current HF rig in your shack. With its 4.3-inch color touchscreen, you can easily control the rig and find the band activity using the waterfall display.
To learn more about the IC9700 or any of the other fine ICOM products, go to www.icomamerica.com forward slash amateur or click on the ICOM banner in this week's show notes page. And when you visit your local ICOM dealer to purchase your IC9700, be sure to tell them that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO Today. Do you know if the BBHN is still operational? Are they still doing their things? And if they're if they are, are they doing it on the same kind of platforms that your that Arden is doing, or have they? When you say it, it's it's forked, has it? Which direction has it gone in? Yeah, it stayed pretty stagnant. They haven't uh, that I'm aware of. They haven't uh, had a release since my partner and I uh, went our own way. And you know, it was a the, the software at the time we we forked the project didn't didn't support. Uh, a very long list of devices. You know, it's probably twenty uh, percent of the device count that we have today on the Arden open source project. So, what are the innovations and enhancements that Arden made to the original BBHN? BBHN was based on OpenWRT, which is a uh, open source project that that is for wireless routers and. Uh, OpenWRT's objective is to uh, make their software run in as many routers as possible. Uh, and there, there, there are a, a number of router manufacturers that have their own proprietary operating systems. And, and of course, they would never be in play uh, because they would never uh, have facilities to allow some someone like the Arden uh, project to load its software on their devices. But uh, most of them, in order to save uh, development cost, take OpenWRT as a as a basis for their their operating system, and then they customize it, add to it to uh, offer the unique features feature set that they feel would sell more of their product. So Arden is also based on that, and up until up until about a year ago, uh, we uh, had a fairly closed development environment. We called ourselves open source, and certainly anybody that wanted to put the effort into it could uh, could also uh, you know develop uh, on that core. But uh, it wasn't until about a year ago when we uh, we put all our code on GitHub, which is a very uh, common uh, or popular open source uh, development. Uh, website and uh, and now uh, we've we've accumulated gosh uh, six or eight new uh, volunteer hams uh, to help us code so development is going at a much faster rate now than it ever has and uh, we have uh, where where originally we had ported the BBHN software only over to a limited number of ubiquity devices uh, ubiquity is a you know, serves the, the wireless ISP community. Uh, we now have uh, ported that software over to two others, TP-Link and um, Microtik. Which is Routerboard, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly, Routerboard. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. The last count, I think we probably have 30 or 35 devices that, we are, that we're running on. And that's one of our objectives is, uh, is to not make uh, the hardware... Uh, choice part of the software choice. So uh, if you choose to run Arden software, you have the greatest availability of, of product offerings. And we've we've added lots of uh, support for network management. We've uh, we've increased the speed of of it uh, to 802.11n, uh, which is 144 megabits per second. These uh, these Arden networks can run uh, much faster than most uh, of your ISPs uh, that are delivering those services to your home. Um, so it, it ends up being a very viable uh, technology for building these networks, and uh, they are in the process of being built all over the country and, uh, to a lesser extent, the entire world. Okay, so I saw... A number of slide presentations that you made that are posted online. Thank you very much. They're great, and I'll put links to those in the show notes page. Is there a specific Arden topology that you recommend for building out these networks? Uh, say, 
So, for example, it appears to me that you've you've pretty much covered San Diego County, maybe most of Southern California. What's the topology that you use in order to build out those networks? So, you know, it's called it's called mesh, and it and indeed the devices do form a mesh when you when you bring up a a, a, a number of these nodes, as we call them, they all recognize each other and start start talking to each other, and they form sort of a clustered a cluster of links. And indeed, the mesh technology that operates in that fashion has has lots of advantages. Uh, you, you know, they're, it, it's incredibly redundant. You know, you can you can have you can have anything interrupt a link and and not cause uh, you know an outage in the network and so forth. But what we have found over the years is that when you leave hams to do that, uh, what develops is a bunch of ham, uh, or uh, what develops is a bunch of of mesh island. You know, these islands might be a community wide or a, a, a town wide and so forth. But nothing, uh, you know, nothing is there to bridge, let's say, a a mesh island in North San Diego County with somebody in East San Diego County, uh, somebody in South Bay, all of them uh, are operating as fully fleshed uh, Arden mesh networks, but they don't interoperate. So what I decided to do uh, uh, is to use San Diego as a bit of a guinea pig. And I developed what I have called, I've come to call, a backbone throughout the county. And this backbone uh, is intended to be a high spot in the topology and geography that mesh islands can p- point to high gain antenna to to become part of the bigger uh, amateur radio mesh. That same approach uh, has been used to interconnect uh, the counties of Southern California together. Um, so, some years ago, um, uh, uh, p- some of us that were really into this technology got together and and sort of established some ground rules on on how these networks were to be built, and and um, uh, we 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 divvied up on a county by co- county basis uh, the whole of Southern California. I took San Diego County and the southern part of Riverside County, and so forth. Similar people are you know are responsible uh, for implementing in Orange and Los Angeles, Ventura, Santa Barbara. San Bernardino and so forth. And uh, now that all of those interconnects uh, have been put in place, we have a, a, a an RF based internet covers the Mexican border up through Santa Barbara and then east to Coachella Valley. Uh, that would be Palm Springs and Indio. This thing has uh, taken on a life of its own. And uh, I'm excited to say that now there are people that are building useful, very useful applications for MCOM uh, to run on the network. You know, it was one thing to to build the network, but then you sat around and you just looked at the network. There wasn't any <laughs> wasn't anything useful, meaningful to do with the network. But uh, that's changing rapidly now. I'm thinking a lot about how we might deploy a, a mesh network here. Do you recommend starting as these community clusters? And then putting the backbone in, because it seems to me that that actually might be the way to to actually um, create some excitement uh, at first is to get uh, individuals to create mesh nodes, what, on two gigahertz, for example, and uh, start connecting their community together and then start thinking about uh, putting in the interconnections between communities. If you're starting from scratch now, how would you approach it? Yeah, I think I probably would uh, still start it as uh, small mesh islands. W- what will happen with small mesh islands is they'll take advantage of a, a feature that we've added to the software called tunneling. And what tunneling does is it allows you to uh, connect a mesh island through an encrypted internet pipe to another mesh island, and uh, all the routing traffic is passed through that tunnel uh, so that it appears to be one larger network. That's all good and fine, so long as it's used for the right purpose, and that is to to provide that connectivity while you're still building the RF-based interconnectivity between the meshes. The problem with that strategy is that 
the, uh, the internet is likely not going to be there during an emergency. And if you're building this for MCOM, you had better not become complacent or satisfied with the operation of this larger mesh based on these tunnels. Um, and I, I uh, to be honest, I'm a little uh, disappointed that so many of those tunnels are being used today because I think in the, in the long haul, it, it ends up uh, detracting from the real purpose, which is to build a ham-based RF uh, network that, uh, that uh, you know, will operate when all else fails. Well, I think I, th- I see the same thing in DMR systems, uh, All-Star. I'm on All-Star. All, all of these uh, internet-linked radio systems are really cool, and it's really easy to get complacent and say, oh, you know, it just works, but you're not, you know, you're still using that trillion dollars worth of infrastructure that that you're dependent on in order to interconnect whereas Arden sounds to me that this is the best way to to to, to bring all of those systems together um, on a independent infrastructure that's uh, not dependent on the internet for you know to be working yep many clubs are, are starting to do that now hey this is Eric with this quick break I'm a big podcast listener with over 20 podcasts loaded automatically into my smartphone every week. My favorite ham radio podcast is the Ham Radio Workbench podcast with George KJ6VU and Jeremy KF7IJZ. Every other week, George and Jeremy take a deep dive into their workbench projects that become boards and plans on their website. If you're a ham radio builder or want to be a home brewer, then be sure to click on the link to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast in this week's show notes page. How does Arden cross into the to the internet? Do you use even for for maybe for MCOM? Do you use any internet resources on Arden? And how do you limit those or control you know what's actually coming from the internet as a resource? Yeah, no, that's a really good question actually. Um, so each each node has the ability to become an internet gateway for the rest of the mesh, and uh, it's as simple as uh, clicking uh, an option in the the setup. Uh, menu or setup page, but we, as a general rule, discourage the use of an internet gateway like that because, you know, what you get from the internet is typically encrypted and, you know, while during a disaster, it may be, you know, quite a reasonable thing to do, but there are many hams that feel that that's risking their ham radio license by uh, passing encrypted traffic. That, That is a discussion in and of itself, that I have spent hours and hours with passionate hams on. But that isn't to say that you won't you won't encounter an emergency operations center that wants access to Web EOC, which is the uh, the, the popular uh, you know cloud based disaster management software available today. Most all EOCs have access to that software, and it's all internet based and it's all encrypted. We certainly recognize that during times of disaster, you have to provide the services that the the customer you're serving needs, and that's all good and fine. But one thing we don't want an Arden Mesh Network to be is an alternative internet access facility for hams that you know maybe don't want to pay for an ISP themselves. I read someplace in my research that perhaps you guys are using WinLink. Uh, as a way, if you if you needed to send email, for example, out of the Arden network, are these the kinds of gateways you're looking at that are like quote unquote ham radio gateways that get you to get messaging in and out? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but there are other ways of doing it as well. Like for instance, a proxy server. You you, you see this with organizations. Uh, uh, Red Cross might be one of them. You know, the Oxcoms groups might be another. <clears throat> you know, they. They see a need for that, so they set up on, on uh, w- within their data centers a proxy server that talks to the Arden network on one side and the internet on the other. And so, you know, you can run unencrypted connectivity between the client at the say the, the disaster shelter site and the at the headquarters site, and then encrypted from there out to the. Uh, you know, the cloud-based service that you're looking to gain access to. The you know, same thing applies with um, the Red Cross Safe and Well app. That's a cloud-based service that provides the 
the uh, impacted communities uh, the, the ability to to let others know that they're safe and well and so they you know they'll there'll be a bank of laptops at the shelter and they'll be able to uh, connect through the Arden network to a proxy server to the uh, cloud-based service you know where they they can identify themselves as being safe now, have you developed uh, multiple access points in the Arden network so that, for example, if you needed to get to the Red Cross Safe and Well application or server, but a, a portion of the network is actually off the regular internet because of some disaster, like the, the recent fires, say for uh, for example in Malibu, uh, so so maybe the any any of the Arden nodes that happen to be over there that might have a proxy server to the internet. In that in that location, essentially, there's a there's a, a back door that could be down in say the Coachella Valley, for example. Are are you doing those kinds of uh, things and that kind of coordination? Yeah. Uh, so the Arden project is is really a a software development project, and my implementation in San Diego and South Riverside County is not part of the project per se. It's just another passion I have about implementing this technology. I would say within the the network that I operate, um, I would selectively ask Hams to uh, click the box, you know, that that says yes, I'll extend internet access, and then those devices that can't connect through their proxy uh, can then use that as an alternate routing means. Um, and I think I think most Hams would be willing to do that if it were a bona fide disaster. Some hams would be in, would be interested in doing that anytime anybody asked for it, but at a minimum, you know, d- during times of a real disaster, hams step up and recognize that they're able to do whatever they they have at their disposal to support the health and well being of the people that are being served. In an MCOM environment, are you then putting mesh nodes in places other than? Ham radio QTHs. Yeah, uh, in, in fact, the the ham radio QTH uh, doesn't serve the MCOM community all that well, unless you're one of those lucky hams that live in, you know, on the top of a mountain. So the the, the topology which I began to describe as you know based on these backbone nodes, then uh, will have sort of a mid tier supporting structure infrastructure which I call mid-mile nodes or relay nodes. And they sit on, on uh, uh, you know, lower uh, hilltops and support uh, local communities. And, and then during times of, of actual disaster, HAMS that support disaster organizations will then uh, take a go, an, uh, an Arden Go kit out to a site and set it up so that it can connect up to a mid-mile slash relay node, or maybe even to the backbone node directly, uh, but then at the same time serve the local cluster of users right there at the shelter uh, with a wi- with Wi-Fi access so they can connect their cell phones and laptops and so forth and uh, connect through to their headquarters operation. And how do you manage non-HAMS? connecting via Wi-Fi to the Arden network and using it for this kind of stuff? Or is there some special ruling or some some way that you're handling this? Well, first, in order to gain access, they get to our website. Uh, The website uh, asks them to register. We look up their call sign when uh, when they they have asked for a registration and confirm that they're a ham. Um, But uh, in the end, the, you know, what, what keeps these devices from being called Part 15 devices versus Part 97 devices uh, really amounts to the frequencies you choose to operate them on, and whether you put your call sign in the uh, you know the node name ID. And if you put it in the node name ID, then it's uh, the node is going to uh, identify uh, you by call sign as the control operator. Every 10 minutes, just like we do on uh, VHF and UHF and, and HF, for that matter. So we make sure that that identification requirement is maintained. <clears throat> but if they don't have a call sign and they, they don't do that, then they, they stick out pretty obviously uh, in the mesh. 
And, uh, of course, hams are pretty good at self-policing, and that's how they're taken care of. Uh, could could somebody, uh, let's say, a, you know, a group of, of preppers uh, set up their own mesh based on our software and, and operate it unbeknownst to us? Yeah, they probably could, but then, you know, they can operate uh, my Kenwood TMD 700 just as easily. And, um, you know, we, we, it's not a new problem. It's the same problem we have been managing for years when it comes to unauthorized use of ham radios. It's my understanding that the 2 gigahertz amateur band and the 5 gigahertz amateur band kind of overlaps the ISM band a little bit. Does, does Arden know the difference in terms of where the band edges are? And if you had, for example, a, an unlicensed person using, in an MCOM situation, for example, an unlicensed person using the network, would this, could the system actually limit them to that portion of the ISM band so that, in, in other words, the, the Arden network could be configured in such a way that that it looks like a public Wi-Fi network? Yeah, uh, there's some things about the nodes themselves that, that distinguish themselves from uh, regular Wi-Fi, but you could operate this within the, fifth, the, the Part 15 spectrum, the ISM spectrum on either of those two bands. Um, al- although uh, the, the 5 gigahertz band actually, uh, hams are, are a superset of what's available for Wi-Fi there, and hams are a subset on the 2 gigahertz band. In other words, channels 1 through 6 are in the ham band, but 7 through 14 are not, or 7 through 11, I suppose, in the U.S., yeah, so yeah, nothing prevents them from doing that. You know, like uh, you know, like any uh, use of of a ham radio, the responsibility for knowing the laws of what uh, what frequencies you're allowed to operate on, what power levels you're allowed to operate within, and so forth, are the responsibility of of the licensee, of course. Now, when I think of uh, mesh networking, at least you know here in Israel, I'm thinking all the time of uh, of building a a node that uh, is self-contained, solar-powered, in case the commercial power goes down. Have you guys uh, built a bill of materials and, and a design for a small solar-powered node that could go on a ham radio operator's house? Yeah, um, we, to my knowledge, don't publish one on our website. There are there are hams that have have identified links in in the forum, the support forum. Uh, that other hams can go explore and follow. Uh, there are certainly plenty of them that have been built. Uh, my backbone nodes, for example, are all have backup power and so forth. Yeah, I would say, no, we really don't have one we would point you to, although I could certainly spend a few minutes uh, doing the research for you and find uh, a number of them. It, would that be the ideal? I mean, uh... When hams decide to become an Arden, or I'm using the word node, maybe that's the wrong the wrong term, but when they decide to put up uh, an Arden mesh network node, well, what do they normally do? They just, it's house powered and they buy the ubiquity equipment, they use a, a, PO, a power over ethernet switch or something to power it. What do you see as the most prevalent way of deploying this at the customer level? My experience tells me that most hams uh, operate them off AC mains uh, when the devices or the clusters are at their house and when they are putting together go kits uh, to support uh, AMCOM work, then they are uh, looking to their customer to define for them what the uh, the service standard is they're looking for. And I, in, in most cases, uh, I, I find it 72 hours that within the first 72 hours, uh, there's uh, there are no alternatives to this method of communications, and within 72 hours they've restored basic services. Uh, you know that obviously obviously isn't always going to be the case, but you have to put some sort of limit on on the design requirement. And uh, in order to get to 72 hours, you really don't need uh, solar power. You just buy a big uh, car battery and uh, put it on trickle charge, and when the power dies, you you know that node is going to run for a hundred plus hours or whatever. <clears throat> by the by, the time and maybe this is a term you were looking for just a minute ago. By the time you put up a cluster of Arden nodes, um, there may be 
to you know two or one or one or two links to the the backbone or the mid mile nodes or maybe a couple of sector antennas that are uh, distributing uh, the the Arden network downward to the lower lying communities, uh, and you've got a uh, as you said a, a PoE switch uh, to power. So you've got about five devices, each of which is running about 300 milliamps uh, of current demand. So amp and a half, 72 hours, you, you put a 100, 120 amp hour battery, gets you to 72 hours pretty easily. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own homebrew designs. Be sure to browse Han's entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. Okay, so what kind of services, then, are you running over the Arden network? Yeah, so that's not really a question for me so much as it is for the hams that are supporting uh, supporting the uh, organizations that are using the network, uh, but I, but I, uh, I, w- we see things like uh, a chat application for a text-based messaging. We see um, uh, email of several different varieties, in- including WinLink, which is by far the most popular of them. We see um, uh, security camera video streams uh, from mountaintop mounted. Uh, uh, you know, uh, pan tilt zoom uh, cameras, uh, some of which, by the way, have been uh, used very effectively for uh, the firefighting effort, uh, Ventura, Santa Barbara, and, and those uh, those counties that were so uh, devastated by the fires lately, uh, recently. Um, and then we're seeing we're seeing actually a new uh, type of application being built and run. Uh, and that that is a a disaster resource management systems where um, you know you can dispatch somebody to a disaster site. Uh, you can message them. You can keep track of uh, you know how long they've worked, you know, when they need to take a break. Uh, you can manage the ham radio support of a disaster with the app, and it's all uh, graphical and map based. So. <clears throat> you can uh, see at a glance where your resources are and and uh, and move them if necessary. Uh, you know, all based on an Arden mesh uh, b- based uh, map tile server, which, as you move around geographically in the map, the tile server will keep you uh, with uh, you know the correct zoom level and the and the correct uh, street map of of where you're interested in. There's one in particular that I. Uh, I'm pretty impressed with called MCOM map, which I think if you were to Google, you would find a, a demo site and an example of what I'm describing. Okay, so uh, I guess well, one of the things we have to say to maybe the uninitiated listeners, and I'm one of the uninitiated hosts here when it comes to uh, mesh networking in Arden, that this is a communications network very similar to you know, a, a local area network or a wide area network, meaning that these applications don't just exist on the Arden network. They're actually server applications that are sitting in the homes or offices of ham, the ham radio operators that are connected to the network, right? So if I wanted to operate this um, MCOM map application, there's actually an MCOM map server somewhere on the network. Exactly, exactly right. And uh, most of the time, they're run on uh, Raspberry Pis that are uh, that are powered off the PoE switch. So when you uh, you know when you're building one of these clusters, you would definitely uh, house your services there at the at the cluster so that you're not dependent on 
some other site that may or may not be hardened and may or may not have uh, emergency power. So, for example, if the El Cajon Amateur Radio Club members wanted to have a voice over IP system so that they could call each other on VoIP phones, for example, by putting in their call signs, then essentially they could just put a uh, an asterisk application, an asterisk telephone server on a Raspberry Pi uh, in one of their members' houses, and essentially they've created their own communication system within their club. But that doesn't prevent from any other cluster or groups of, of, of hams anywhere in the Arden network from creating similar kinds of applications. No, that's right. And and indeed, that's very popular. Asterisk is uh, probably the uh, single most predominant uh, P- uh, uh, server-based PBX. And, you know, we're actually trunking the PBXs together now, and we're, we're holding uh, – nets on these VoIP phones. Uh, there's a, a weekly uh, discussion that goes on here in Southern California where you dial into a conference line on one of these PBXs and you sit there and chat with, you know, 10, 15, 20 hams that, uh, you know, are all going through uh, the same sort of ardent experience. So A full duplex, right? Just like your telephone. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty cool. Right. Do you see that your footprint could be large enough that a Wi-Fi, quote-unquote, like a Wi-Fi handy-talkie, push-to-talk device, I I see a a few of them in the marketplace now. I even think that um, ICOM has Wi-Fi push-to-talk walkie-talkies. Do you see that um, it's possible to combine this kind of technology with a a network like the Arden network so that one could carry a a wideband handy-talkie that works between these nodes? Yeah, although... I I would say your cell phone is probably uh, just as well suited, if not more so for that. You know, your cell phone will talk uh, over uh, Wi-Fi. It'll be, you know, there are a multitude of applications that that support that. And at a disaster site, and I'll take you back to the MCOM example, uh, you you can provide Wi-Fi access to people at the shelter and they connect their phones to it and use a VoIP app to to call others uh, th- throughout the, the mesh network. Uh, that's being used uh, a lot. But, I, yeah, I don't see any reason why you, you uh, couldn't, as a, as a VHF, UHF uh, manufacturer, develop that support and uh, provide push-to-talk. For... I just don't know. I, I just don't know that hams would necessarily use it for that unless, it's, unless they – they feel uh, that they're making Arden more of the traditional ham radio experience. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've done presentations and and uh, the a hand in the back will be raised and they'll say, well, where's the push to talk button? And I don't have one to show them. <laughs> Right, because it's it's a backbone. Uh, it's not it's not the end user device. Do you have uh, repeaters yep. uh, like some repeaters using, for example, All Star or I- IRLP or something like that that are using the Arden network or their backbone? Yep, yeah, DMR. Yep, that, absolutely. And that's the preferred way to go, ultimately. Um, I, I would imagine. I'm not particularly passionate about any of those uh, mm-hmm. technologies, but nor do I know a lot about them. But, you know, I, I do see uh, the discussions going on in supporting them on our, on our forum, on our website, uh, ardenmesh.org. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I see more and more of that going on. It seems like every week there's, there's a new uh, group that's uh, coming on board to, to do just that. What's the exciting future for Arden Mesh in terms of uh, new developments yeah, so we do have a couple of uh, features on the on our roadmap that I'm pretty excited about. One, you know, t- today the, the the mesh is a little exposed to uh, to non hams and poor performers that uh, are detracting from the operation of the network. And as as a ham, you have the choice, you know, just as you would on a repeater, to uh, disinvite uh, individuals who are causing problems on the network. That's a, a feature I'm looking forward to. And I'm also looking forward to a, a quality of service function. And we're not quite sure how uh, we need to approach this, but the, the objective is to, during times of real emergency, that those uh, nodes that are supporting real emergency traffic get 
some level of priority higher than the typical ham that may be uh, streaming uh, video from his shack or you know whatever. And and today those all run you know at the same priority level and. It would be great to have uh, that feature available during a real, real disaster. And as I said, beyond that, uh, support for more uh, m- more products and support for maybe uh, different routing protocols that uh, are more efficient and maybe faster in terms of of uh, updating routing tables and that sort of thing. But that's kind of an esoteric uh, discussion. Uh, but you know, it interests people like myself because uh, we spend a lot of time. Uh, in, in you know discussing those kinds of things. Well, I, I think that anybody that that doesn't want to go deep into Arden has probably stopped listening. I, I do have a question. Video, for example, IP video takes a lot of bandwidth. Does Arden, being a mesh network, does it load distribute that bandwidth in order to uh, essentially keep from wiping out uh, an Arden node? No, it, it does not. Uh, what does happen though is the <clears throat> the encoding. The, the, the video encoders, uh, some are much better at slowing the speed down on demand and speeding up when the bandwidth is available so that those dynamics are often uh, managed well, often not so much. And, and the, the, you know, the, the user sees it uh, pretty quickly in the, in the actual you know, jittering of the chopping of the, the video image and so forth. Um, so he he or she learns pretty quickly to manually f- force the speed of of those uh, isochronous data streams, you know, himself, because he he wants a a good sharp picture that it that you know, doesn't look so much like uh, a- amateur the, the traditional amateur radio uh, television stations. In fact, we're seeing a lot of slow scanners that are actually moving over to uh, they're going digital via Arden and. Uh, uh, I don't know if they're actually dropping some of their old analog slow scan technology or if, if they're just augmenting it, but there's a fair fair number of them that are moving over. If you were going to estimate, how many hams in Southern California are on Arden now? Well, if you look at uh, how many hams, I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you we have right at 400 active uh, Arden nodes on the Southern California network. Between Santa Barbara and San Diego. Yep. So that's about mm-hmm. 200 coastal miles, right, would you say? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. 200 coastal miles and then inland, uh, you know, another 100 miles. Yeah. What kind of impact amateur radios had on your family life? <laughs> I, uh, yeah. That, no, it's funny. I, so I will, uh, I, I have to admit that it's, you know, it makes me chuckle because when I uh, was married, when I got married for the first time, I, uh, I didn't think to have a, a prenup that sort of defined <laughs> the, the, the demands I was going to put on the relationship from a ham radio perspective. But my first wife did not did not want to be the you know the home in, in the neighborhood that had that big ugly antenna. And then, as you know, we've discussed. I lost my wife uh, to an illness here a couple of years ago. Um, and and uh, have since remarried, and uh, again I failed to 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 make ham radio and antennas a condition of of our relationship progressing. So, you know, I guess I guess I'm just not a good study when it comes to that sort of thing. I remember it was a surprise to my wife on our honeymoon when I turned on the two meter radio and you know started calling CQ in the middle of New Mexico, and she she turned to me and she says, "What what are you doing?" I said, well, I'm seeing if there's anybody out there to talk to. She says, well, I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? I guess I guess it's the uh, proliferation of digital uh, modes. I, you know, I think that has that has a sort of a newfound interest uh, or respond to newfound interest in, 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 for a lot of hams, and and I think it's bringing a lot of new hams. To the hobby, I know that Arden, being one of those, um, uh, you know, seems to be uh, seems to be a good connect point between the the amateur radio hobby as we know it and the interest level of uh, younger teens who you know are sort of looking for uh, s- something to pursue their 
you know, their, their computer interests and ham radio and these technologies, I think, tend, tend to draw them. Yeah, I, I am blown away by all of the, the young people and the students, uh, college students, who are uh, exploring and adopting the Arden uh, technology. And I, you know, I can only read what goes on with uh, some of these HF uh, digital modes and replacing RTTY on the HF bands. It's exciting. I just wish I had the time to actually explore some of that myself. Well, I actually hadn't thought of Arden uh, being a way to, or mesh networking to be a way of attracting young hams. But in fact, it's a parallel universe, isn't it? And a uh, a licensed parallel universe. So that may in fact be a way to attract younger hams into the hobby. We, you know, I'm putting on presentations routinely to existing hams, <clears throat> the ham clubs, and even international MCOM uh, symposiums and and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, uh, some of our developers are, are going to the Unix and Linux conferences and uh, setting up booths to dis, you know to uh, attract an interest from that side uh, as well. So I agree with you. Wow, that could create a, a, an amazing open source community that supports uh, Arden and Ham Radio in the future. Yep. What advice would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? You know, this is something brand new to offer, and um, it'll be foreign to to both of those uh, groups. You know, I would say that if there are people that are interested in learning something new, boy, does the hobby have a lot to offer to them today. I'll say, I would say that I woke up after 25 years and found the whole thing had changed for the good. Yep. Andre, thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. I know that we've kind of scratched the surface of of Arden. If the listeners want to reach you somehow and find out more about what you're doing and what Arden is, uh, what's the best way to do that? Probably on uh, the the ArdenMesh.org website, you'll find uh, succinct instructions on on uh, how to build uh, these these devices and these networks. Uh, the technology on how this all works, as they explained, uh, you'll find. Uh, you know, people that are at all stages of, of learning, understanding, and implementing this stuff uh, there on the forum. Uh, it's a very active forum. We probably we have probably 100 posts a week or so. Uh, the developers, uh, both uh, those that are part of the core team and also those that are, are uh, participating in the open source development side of it, are always responding very quickly to uh, to questions and um, so i i expect the uh, I- inquiring ham would find lots of support there in a friendly environment to participate in well that sounds great i've got um also some some links to some youtube presentations that you've made and i'll put in the show notes page so there's a lot of resources on your show notes page as well andre thank you so much for joining me on the qso today podcast it was really a pre- pleasure and with that, I want to wish you 73. All right, 73, Eric. K6AH, clear. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Andre. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in K6AH in the search box at the top right corner of the homepage. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric 4Z1UG73. 
The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x, xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.pa0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 megahertzshop.nl. 70 mhzshop.nl.
Heb ik een phone naar retour?